The first reading for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost is from Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved, look he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 15, is printed in the insert of the bulletin, and is seen on the screen. We'll read the psalm responsively. Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right. They do not slander with their tongue. They do no evil to their friends. In their sight the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. The second reading for today is from James. James chapter 1 verses 17 through 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his cre creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger for righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save our souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and, and preservance, being not hearers, but forget, I have to read that over, sorry. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and, are perse and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they're religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained, unstained by the world. The Word of God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The reading is selections from Mark chapter seven. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support 
you might have had from me is korban, that is, an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many things like this. He called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. He said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil attention, intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, arvis, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved of God's heart and beloved of my heart, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to say thank you for some time away at the end of July and August, time away from the joys and the stresses of this calling to reconnect with my own family and a few dear friends, some of whom also share this call to public ministry, and time to spend with James's family, with our nieces and nephews that are so special to us that we usually get to see only once a year. And they just keep getting bigger <laughs> and more fun. And I also realized how connected I feel to you, to this community of faith, and how much I missed you after being gone for a few Sundays in a row. The people that make this church such a good place to be, such an alive, invigorating, truly happy place. So a word that really stood out for me in our reading this week from James is religion. Because religion is related to the word ligaments. It means to be connected, literally re-ligamented, rejoined, reconnected, to one another. That's what religion means, to be reconnected to God and to each other. Because of course we cannot claim to be a Christian without Christ claiming us as his and reconnecting us to God, our creator. In the same way, we cannot be a Christian apart from other Christians. Christ joins us to his body, the body of Christ, the family of God. That is the center of our faith, that we are joined together to God and to one another, that Jesus makes us right with God, something that we cannot do on our own. Jesus grants us forgiveness and new life, that we don't have to forever spend our lives trying to appease a fickle God. We spend our life getting to know a faithful God, a God who fills us with love so that we can love our neighbor. And that is an action, isn't it? Love is an action, as we heard about love in the first reading from Song of Solomon, and then it is insinuated in the Gospel reading for today. And James talks about that, how our faith is put into action. We are to be doers of the word, not merely hearers. Through scripture, we come to know God as love, and his love is capable of accomplishing transformation and rescue for our own self and transformation and rescue for people that seem or look very different from ourselves. Often we can ask of a scripture passage, what does this say about who God is? That's a great question to come to scripture with. What does this say about who God is? And then the second question, what does this say about who I am? In the reading from James, God is identified by what he gives. Did you memorize that verse when you were young? Every perfect gift comes from above. The gifts come down from the Father of lights. God is called the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation due to change. God is always giver because God is creator. This, of course, recalls Genesis, where God brings light into being and puts all the particular lights in the heavens. 
biblical scholar Craig Kester reminds us, it's important to note God, our Father and Creator, has no shadow side or dark side. Even though my kids have watched just a few scenes from the Star Wars movies, they are pretty enthralled with the characters, and they each have these lightsaber things. And one will say to the other, I have the Force. You cannot hurt me. And the Force in those movies is this energy field comprised of all living things. And the Force has a dark side. And the lives of the major characters in Star Wars are shaped by whether they draw upon the bright side or the dark side of the force. Well, the Bible tells us that God does not have a dark side. God is not simply an energy force that people tap into at their will. God is the giver of all good things. God is the one who conveys life simply by his will, not ours. James goes on to say, God brought us to life using the true word. This is a language of birth. This new life in relationship to God. James says that those who are given this new birth are called first fruits. It's harvest time. Think about what a first fruit is. The first fruit is like bringing the first load of wheat or the first load of beans to the elevator and writing on it Faith Lutheran Church or Red Willow Bible Camp on the ticket that the first part of the crop is given to God knowing that all of the crop is a blessing from God just like the first hour first day of our week is given to God to indicate that the whole of our week the whole of our life is a gift from God given as an offering back to God. These first fruits are the ripe sheaves of grain. They are a sign of the greater harvest to come. They are always a sign in the Bible that there is more to come. They are the first of a great harvest. As the life of Christ lives in you, your actions are changed. And you strive to be as James describes. Strive to listen before you speak. Putting your ears ahead of your tongue. That's hard for some of us sometimes. Remembering our grandma's words that we have two ears and one mouth. But we do as we practice that wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We do become slow to anger knowing that God's righteousness does not grow from human anger. So now, James moves on to that second question. We answered, who is God in this passage? And now the second question, who are you? Do you let the word of God go in one ear and out the other? Or do you act on what you hear? It's a deeply personal question. As James asks, do you see who you are? Normally, when we hear that question, we think of wrinkles or scars, or maybe that my hair needs a trim. But that is not the question. It's similar to how Jesus responds to the Pharisees' question about ritual hand washing. Jesus says, does it really matter if your hands are ritually washed if you are up to your elbows in evil, does it really matter? Jesus asks these people who have bragged about dedicating their fortunes to God, dedicating them to the temple, only to get around the commandment to honor and care for their aging parents, often the widow. Clean hands, evil heart. Do you see who you are, James asks. You are someone who has been blessed by God's gifts. You are someone who has been brought to new life by God's word. You are someone who belongs to God. You are set apart for God's purposes. So will you remember that, James asks. Will you remember that and care for the widow and the orphan in their distress? 
that was who needed to know the love of God the most in the community that James writes to. Who are those in our community who would be the widow and the orphan, those who need extra care, who are maybe forgotten or vulnerable? Often it is children or our elderly. James asks, will you forget how much God loves you and how much God has given to you and conclude that I'll just get ahead while I can. It's just too bad about that widow. It's too bad about that little kid. It's too bad about the sick and the diseased. That's just the way the world is. Our actions matter. James says, our actions show the world our witness. So are we people who do the word of God and care for the hungry and the sick? Do we tend the connections that we have to one another in the body of Christ? Or are we people who hear the word of God and forget? James says, look at yourself again in the perfect law of liberty because you are doing these things not to earn God's favor. It is at your liberty to do them, to respond to that need because God has given you all that is good. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, James goes on to say in the next chapter. And it's a beautiful thing when we see that lived out, to love someone someone dear to us who has lost many possessions in a house fire, someone dear to us who has a family member suffering with cancer, someone unknown to us who is in need of food or shelter. To know love is the most freeing thing imaginable, even as that same love constrains us, guides our behavior, holds us in a relationship, as we live out the love of God to one another. In so doing, we become who God has created and ordained us to be. As we keep the center, as we keep the central thing the center, God's love and our love for one another, our church, small, us, and the whole church, big, all 10,000 of us, 10,000 congregations, as we keep that the center, Jesus' love and our love for one another, we can come through any challenges or any disagreements which are on the edge, which are on the edge of our joyful witness that Jesus Christ is Lord and he makes all things new, including me and you. And as we trust these words of scripture from John, the great evangelist, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That is the story that John tells how Jesus came into this world, not because we invited him, but out of the Father's love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. That is John's witness. The crucified and risen Christ is present here. Jesus comes and stands alongside us. Christ is faithful to his children. Christ is faithful to his promise to be present in the word proclaimed, in the bread broken, the wine poured, the baptism remembered. May this be our witness. That story needs to be told. People are waiting to hear it. People are waiting to hear it again. They're waiting to hear it for the first time. That Christ is present. And wherever Christ is, there is peace and joy, because where Christ is present, there is new life and forgiveness. Thanks be to God.